so it is 12 o'clock. So I'm going to kick off this webinar today. I'm Lisa Hickey from the Manatee County Extension Office, and I'm the host for our sustainability series. I'm number 10 in the series, and my topic uh, that I actually chose was to discuss the components of sustainable food systems. And I'm going to kind of give a little broad background and skip back in time. Then I'm going to talk about some objectives of what I would like you guys to take from this today. And then I'm going to go into those different components and some of the things that are sustainable in our food systems, some of the things that aren't, uh, what is our role in some of those, and basically trying to get you to get that thought process to start um, when it comes to sustainability and how we can impact those systems. So with that, I just want to basically start with some of the, uh, if you're new to webinars, there is a Q&A box and I am actually presenting to you guys and I'm watching that Q&A box. So what I'll try to do is take a break every now and then, look at my question and answer box just to make sure that if it's something I can address then, if I miss it by the time I get to the end, I have allowed time for questions and I can cover them there. It's kind of like I have to be multitask and sometimes that can distract from the programming. Um, so I'm going to just know that I'm going to be looking at several windows as I go through here. I don't want to lose eye contact with you, but that's going to be inevitable trying to look at several windows. So let's start back in, uh, over 200 years ago and basically look at the Industrial Revolution. That was a period of time when wealth and materialistic things started happening and it was an exciting part of town, time. But what happened is I believe that it got a little out of control and it started leading into some of the things that are causing some of our issues to sustainability today. So oops, I'm going to have to use the click up here. Um, so I want to then from the Industrial Revolution jump forward a little bit and talk like in the 1950s is when we introduced um, fertilizers and kind of got that increase in crop of, uh, ability. And not only was it fertilizers manufactured, but you had a little bit of pesticides, uh, a little bit, a lot of it maybe, of pesticides at that time. And so then you jump forward to 1962, and uh, that's when uh, Rachel Carson wrote the book Silent Spring. And it really, she's a microbiologist, and it was, I'm sorry, a marine biologist. And she went into the impacts of fertilizers and pesticides and what they are doing to our systems, making it a strong statement and awareness of some of the uh, environmental impacts. She particularly did a lot of research on DDT, which was the chemical that was to kill the egg stage of mosquitoes. And what happened is, is the the DDT actually carried through not only the mosquito eggs, but birds would then actually eat the mosquitoes and then that DDT was in their system and it affected their egg stage. So she did this incredible book that really got people going and thinking. Unfortunately, two years after she wrote that book, she actually passed away due to cancer and uh, it started, uh, I think a lot of us starting to think about fertilizers, pesticides, our environment. And then we skip forward to 2019 where there's an explosion of sustainability issues and talking about sustainability within our food systems. In fact, in, even in the University of Florida, we oh, in 2019 had an explosion of sustainable agriculture and food system extension agents. And that's what my role is. I am a sustainable ag and food systems extension agent. My job is to go out and work with fruit and vegetable growers and try to help them in becoming more sustainable. And I'll pull some of that out as we go through this presentation. So I basically have three different objectives today. One is to define what are the six processes that really are our food systems. What does that mean? Okay. And then I want to be able to increase 
awareness of these components and how they are connected to the environment, to our society, and to the economy. So I'm going to be putting giving you a couple of pointers on those three as a triangle and you'll see a little bit more on that here in a few and then at the end i really would like that we acknowledge that everybody has a role in sustainability of food systems and what is that role what could we do differently that can help us with sustainability on an individual level so I want to I just want to define what sustainable food systems is because there are many definitions out here, but I do like this particular one from john folks he's from the Florida Department of Agriculture and they are the regulatory authority in Florida for fruit and vegetable growers. Um, fertilizer application and pesticide application, so he said that for agriculture to be sustainable. There must be a recognition that farming is a bigger part of the natural and the human ecosystems and every component, every element that's within that um, ecosystem, they're all interconnected and they're all interdependent. And that is like a really broad definition where you can kind of see how big this whole topic of uh, food systems is. But it really is when you bring that kind of a comment that he said down into what does that really mean? Well, it means that we're trying to balance a healthy environment. What are we doing with our soils? What are we doing with water? What are the impacts of pollutants in the system? How are we balancing that with the economy? and making sure that that economy is still profitable, particularly for the farmers, because I'm gonna be talking just the farm side of it this today. And then how uh, is our society needs for generations to come? So sustainability isn't just about today and our, the way we uh, input to sustainability, but it's about how we impact our future generations. And we're talking children's, you know, our grandchildren's children at this point. How does our, what we are doing today, our efforts, impact also them? So this is a really nice um, poster that I found on, not, um, online, and it kind of brings together the concept of what I'm going to talk about in a triangular um, impacts. So you have the environment, you have the society, and you have the e economy and in this poster it's showing the six different components that we're going to go through everything from the bottom left when we talk about food accessibility to the top left where we're talking about the production and and what goes into the production and then to the top right we're seeing the delivery of those foods um, so that's something we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the waste stream and some of the impacts or sustainability to our waste stream. So there are six different components and I'm just going to gently introduce broad, broadly uh, what these components are. So here are the six broad components to food systems. And you can start anywhere because remember they're all interconnected and they're all interdependent. But for simplicity, I'm going to actually start with production of food and then we're going to go on to the processing stage, then distribution. And you can see as this is a circle, you know, it's all going to come back. Then we're going to talk about food access, consumption, some of our roles in consumption, and then waste recovery. And then back into if that waste is recovered correctly, can we use that then as compost to start that production all over again. So uh, this is the triangle that I was talking about earlier when I said that we're going to involve the environment, the economy and the society and at any one point in time, if you take away one of these sides to that triangle. If you take away one of them, there is an imbalance. And sustainability is really trying to, is all about keeping that balance amongst all three of these as we go through the six different components. 
So with saying that, I always like to start off with this graphic, and there's many different resources out there with different numbers, but let's know that back in 1950, one farmer fed 16 people. Today in 2020, one farmer feeds 200 people. So you can see just there in the amount of growth that that farmer is now feeding that we've got to figure something out as far as sustainability. Not only that, let's think forward in time. What is our population projections going to be? Look at just Florida and the projections that we're going to be here. And right now we do have a, a huge agricultural community but as our populations increase, what is that happening to agriculture? It, we're closing in on them. And we're going to talk a little, just a little bit about that. So today's farmer grows twice the amount of crops as his parents did, but with less land, less energy, less water, and fewer emissions into the atmosphere. That's incredible. So right there alone is telling you we're doing something sustainable. We just may not have began this process of reducing our inputs as far as the environmental inputs soon enough to have some long term um, impacts. Everybody that's on this call today, I can guarantee you that if we keep going in a positive direction, not we will not see those impacts. We may see some of it because the science is out there to say what's happening, but for the most part to see a real sustainable food system happening, it's gonna happen in many generations from now. And that's gonna be something about my concluding thoughts as we go through this presentation. So let's look at production first. So production, it's always here where a lot of fingers are pointed and people saying, oh, it's everything's happening because the farmer's not doing something right. But know that that farmer is really responding to supply and demand. As our population increases, we are demanding more supply. And because of that, that farmer has to figure out how to keep meeting that demand with his yield of whatever he's growing, whether it's cattle or the meat side of it, or if it's the fruit and vegetable side of it. So their technology has to get more and more improved. And mostly because as they improve with their technology, some of their inputs can go down. Now, financially, we have to also, when we say we want to look at that triangle, the economy. So equipment and technology cost money to these growers. And somehow that has to come back to them. And we're going to talk about some of that because that could be some of our issues to a farmer themselves. So when you go and buy a fruit or a vegetable, and I'll pick, um, because avocados are coming into the country right now, I'll pick avocado. So an avocado, the cost that you pay for it at the market, you might be paying $10 for 10 pieces of fruit. Do you honestly think it costs only a dollar to produce that avocado? And that's where some of our thought process has to change because within the production of that avocado, we did not account for the cost of equipment, the cost of fuel for that equipment, the cost of any type of energy going into that equipment, the cost for distribution, and some of these other things we're going to talk about in sustainability. One of the things that we need to know is that farmers must balance how much money they put into agriculture with what they end up getting back from it. And right now, I can tell you there is an inequality to how much they are getting back for that product to what they are putting in. And then you say, well, Lisa, how can they sustain? Well, some of them are doing it really well and some of them, and you're gonna see some statistics here of what's happening when they don't do it well enough. Um, when we're talking production, we have to make sure that in the society's level that we are keeping animals welfare in, 
in connection to that whole sustainability. Are we not, are we being gentle with the animals? So think of chickens that are free roaming versus chickens that are put in a cage and required to produce an egg. Think about um, some of our larger animals and how they are put into confined space and just required to grow. So it's really important when you're looking at production. And again, I said, I'm going to talk about the fruits and vegetables just because that's my background. Um, I'm not going to go into the animal side of it, but we have to keep that in that consideration of to be sustainable. We have to make sure we keep the animal's welfare in mind. Um, when farms are doing their production, everything that goes into producing a fruit or a vegetable costs money. So when they're um, working with their irrigation systems, they're making sure that the water that they're using is the right amount to get the best yield of that commodity but they're also making sure that there isn't an excess of water because then the excess is carrying their fertilizer away. So we call um, fertilization on the farms, we say that they have a 4R process to fertilization. And 4R means that they're using the right type of fertilizer, they're using the right amount, they're using the right equipment for application, and they're using the right source to begin with. So all of that, again, costs money and a farmer does not want to get rid of product by accident, his fertilizer or his pesticides, because that's money out of his pocket. So all of that is sustainability. The same way with soil and soil goes hand in hand with that fertilizer. Are, um, how are they treating that soil? Are they using tilling and tilling later disturbs that soil enough that they end up having erosion and erosion carries their um, soil off site, but it also carries with it fertilizer. So there is an incredible balancing act. And then the last comment I put for this bullet is to talk about carbon footprint, because the further away a piece of fruit or vegetable comes from, the more of a carbon imprint the more carbon dioxide is given off to have that item produced. And that is something that when I say, what can we do? That is something where you can get involved is when you're picking up that fruit or vegetable from a market, and we're gonna talk more about this when we talk about food access, but when you're picking it up, turn around and look and see where the heck it is. Where's it coming from? Because if you notice that that product is coming from another country, whether it's Canada or Mexico or Guatemala, wherever it is, the further away it's coming, the more carbon dioxide is used to get it to your plate. And that means if you're buying it from a long distance, then you are saying it's okay that that product came from a long distance. And again, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in access, I don't wanna go into it now under production, but you do have to keep that in mind. And then the last thing, um, when we talk about societal and the economy, regulation really has uh, a say in all of this and a play in all of this, because there are food safety issues, there are labor laws that these farmers have to meet, and then food security. We really wanna know where that food is coming from, what happened to it while it was out in the field. We want to transfer, translate it down the line to see where it's going, all right? So agriculture, so this is a good note. So this is our um, economy and a good note. So agriculture provides 24 million jobs in the United States, and we ship over a hundred billion dollars of our crops to many other countries. So that's awesome. Um, and, and that's good things. So we have to, when we're saying, are we doing some things right? Well, these statistics actually show you some of what we're doing right. So United States, and this is an incredible statistic when you just listen to what the heck it's saying. All right, so United States grows 40% of our world's corn and they use 20% of the land, the total land worldwide to harvest that. That is sustainable. 
So here is um, a little bit of my comment and a little bit of what you need to know when it comes to food production. So we all want high quality, great tasting food, but there's an expense behind getting that desire. All right. And I believe that this is why we're starting to see more movement towards organics because organic production is completely different than what we call our commercial conventional type production. And their inputs are less as far as some of the pollutants, fertilizers or pesticides than are our conventional um, agriculture. And because of that, you will notice when you go to the store and you wanna buy something organic, it's a lot more because they're getting it. They're passing that cost on because they do, that farmer has to go through completely different ways to grow its product um, organically. So anyway, so if we want high yield and we've got to need high yield, sustainability can be compromised because we're gonna produce high, at high yield, but what that ends up impacting is the flavor. So when you go to the market and you buy a tomato and you say, this tomato just doesn't have any flavor. Well, a lot of times that's because we are trying to get it to grow fast, get it on the market before other countries start inundating our markets and we want to sell it. So sometimes it is picked prior to it being fully ripe. It is in a ripe stage and that's why the farms can um, per pick it. But remember, they're trying to meet our yield and in our, I'm sorry, our demand. And that's why sometimes they've got to grow completely different. And these are things, again, think about these as you're going to that store and what you are buying. So I'm going to jump on to the second process. The second process is how do we process these fruits and vegetables? And again, remember, I'm just talking uh, fruits and vegetables. So there, um, we will have refrigerated packing lines and there's a down here at the be below is actually a meat processing plant. And those, uh, when we talk about our society, the people working in that processing plant work in adverse conditions because all day they are standing in 32 to 36 degree rooms and they're on their feet all day that expense to have them in that condition has to be part of what we talk about in the economy. Packing houses are completely the opposite. So a packing house is where the farmer sends his product once it is harvested. The packing houses for the most part are not air conditioned. They are in Florida under the steaming hot weather they usually have flow through air so that uh, they can have some coolness. But think about packing houses in the middle of July. It's an adverse condition that again, you must pay somebody a little bit more to be willing to work in that condition. And when we talk economy, paying that little bit extra, that's all in that equation when you start thinking about sustainability. Packaging, we have to put some thought into the packaging. What is the environmental impact of plastics? It's a huge topic that's been going on for the last few years. Microplastics that end up downstream. You know, you have to start thinking about, well, could we change something about this packaging? Not only the type of packaging, but think about the size of packaging. Have you ever received, and I'm gonna go away from fruits and vegetables here for a minute, but have you ever received anything or looked at anything on the shelf and you got it and you pulled it out of the box and it's mostly box? Well, that's because that size sells and it's what our eyes are looking for. But if you start contrasting your volume for your price, you'll quickly notice that sometimes you're just paying for the packaging versus paying for the actual product. So that's something that we can be aware of as a consumer. There are a lot, again, I mentioned laws for food safety, transparency, and then traceability. There are a lot of laws behind it because of foodborne illnesses. And the farmer must make sure that from the time a product is picked from a field, 
it is identified and goes the whole way through the system so that if somebody gets sick uh, as a consumer, they can trace back to that farmer who in that field picked that product and then try to figure out along the way where did that foodborne illness come from. That costs money. Some of these laws that are now in place are just driving some of the farmers out of business because it makes them do extra things that their pocket was no longer allowing for. So their profitability is eaten into because they have to change some of the ways that they're processing their, their product. Uh, a thing that we can do for sustainability is look for value added products from your local growers. Value added products are like, and I give the example, the picture up here of apples going to applesauce. So that same farmer had extra oranges left over at the end of the season. And he decided instead of turning this orange into a juice, let's see if we can get it to somebody who will put it on a fruit stand and sell it that way. Um, normally value added products are actually in a process. It's not usually from the whole state to the whole state. So a whole orange to a whole orange, something happens. So it could be the opposite where that orange originally was used for retail. It starts looking ugly. So then what the farmer will do is get it to a processing plant to turn it into juice and now get some more mileage out of that. So look for value added products most of them, you're going to note that they need to come from a local source, not a far away source, because we'll go back to that carbon footprint. All right. And then um, what I'm noticing in sustainability is wash water recycling, which we'll talk again. That's one of the processes is how we recover our waste, but wash water recycling. So when they get the crop out of the field, if some kind of cleaning up is need it for that product, they are cleaning it and then they're figuring out how to reuse that wastewater in another way on the farm. So it's a, a part of the processing that sometimes as a consumer, we don't tend to see it. So the next one that the next key component is distribution. So distribution, we're going to go back to those regulations because there's been a lot of change over the last five years of the distribution process. Now, like for instance, a, um, a large truck, like the one in the picture, a and I'm losing the word for what they are, but that large truck, the driver can only drive an X amount of hours before he has to stop, take a break, and that is because they were finding that they were just stressing, pushing themselves too hard, having accidents because they were tired behind the wheel. So regulation came in and basically said, now for every X amount of hours you drive, you have to take a 15 to 20 minute break. I bet a lot of you aren't even aware that that's going on as far as regulations. So I want to now talk real quick on that carbon um, footprint, and then you're going to see some of the foods on the next slide that actually have some huge carbon footprints. But what you need to do at the time of purchase is really look at where is that product coming from. And if you are loving eating avocados, I'll go back to that ex um, example when avocados are not being produced by United States, the sustainable action is that we just eat what's in, in season for our country. So that means that you may not want, you may not be able to eat avocados for a few months because if you decide, well, hey, but there's an avocado in the market being sold, and you look at that and it says Mexico, now you're talking that carbon footprint and you paying for that product coming from another country, you are agreeing and you are part of that carbon footprint. So there's something where we can do our part to change the sustainability. So it is really about buying local and also buying for the season. If you can't do this, and we'll talk this more on food accessibility, but if let's say during the season, peaches are like tons and tons near the end of the season, and then they get, that season goes away, learn how to can, you know, buy up that excess 
skin them, can them, and then now you will have it still in a very fresh stage, but as a canned product. Or look for the growers value add it because sometimes that's what they'll do when they get near the end of the season. But that requires that you're looking for local, right? And um, what another um, action that I saw particularly during COVID is the farmers who ended up selling to distributors quickly learned that they could sell locally to restaurants and continue to get product out there on a local level. So there was some sustainability that did come out of the whole pandemic. It took a while for um, us to kind of pick up our selves and dust ourselves off and start figuring out how do we continue to be sustainable? How do we change? How do we morph into this new style? And so um, selling to the local restaurants versus shipping it out to another state ended up being one of the changes that the farms did um, to be become sustainable with their product. And I know that a lot of you may have heard some of the things of where the farms were literally plowing under fields and fields. And I'm here in Manatee County, I can tell you, I got, there's so many of our growers that back in May, when they just, the pandemic was so new and they had not adjusted, they were turning that product under. The good news to that is we did figure out how to connect them to gleaners. And a gleaner is somebody who comes in when that product can no longer be sold as its initial, initial product. They'll come in and take it off the field and then sell it or give it to like a food pantry. They'll use it in some way so that it's not turned under. And that's part of my role for my position is really to work with these farmers when there's something going on to make sure that their product is moved. I'm gonna quickly look at the window here and um, we're good with questions in the chat box. So here is a little bit about understanding some food um, footprint, the carbon footprint for some of the items. The larger animals, unfortunately, there is a lot of um, carbon footprint there. And I'll give the example of Florida, but I'm not going to go into the whys and everything, but I'll give you some food for thought. So in Florida, we are a cow-calf state, and that means that we have the we um, feed and nourish our larger and our larger cattle, and they have a baby. That baby, after it is born and at a certain age, is then shipped out to California. It is fattened up out there, goes through processing plants, and then at some point comes back to Florida as a steak on your plate. So when you look at that carbon footprint, that's like, oh my gosh. And we'll talk about, we might have time to talk about some of that why, but one of them I can tell you is, is that we don't have any um, processing plants in Florida that can accommodate some of the laws and requirements. But I'm not a livestock agent, so I have to be careful on where we go there with those questions. And if you guys do have questions, I'll make sure you get to your local livestock agent to, that can help with some of those um, questions. But you notice as it goes down through, look at all the different products that you might be eating and see what kind of a footprint that is there. And again, go back to what can you do out of these items? Is there anything there that you can eat local? Can you change the way you eat based on what is available? So that leads us right into food access, which is the next key component to food systems. And it really is, is there equal equity across all groups of people for food access. And I have the picture there with uh, the dog eating that large hamburger, and that gives you an idea of gluttony. So you know that some people obviously have more access to food than those that are in like a food desert. And food deserts, for those of you that aren't aware of what they are, it, they are usually low-income communities that do not have direct access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So their food that they tend to eat is high processed, high fats, high sugars, and they just because that's what their money can afford versus being able to afford fresh fruits and vegetables. 
So you know that the equity is not there. And I have a, just, I have a statistic after this slide on poverty, the level of poverty and hunger. Um, that is something to make you think about when it comes to sustainability. So I have to throw that, are you eating local? Because if you're not eating local, you're not supporting our local farmers. If you're not supporting our local farmers, then they're having a challenge being um, sustainable, particularly our small farms. So in Florida, for the majority of our farms, they are small farms operation. About 80% is the number we use. Here in Manatee County, I have, um, at, 753 farms actually report that they're a farm system and out of that it's about 82 percent that are small farm operations. Small farm operations don't have the funding to send their product far so they keep it local. Farmers markets, um, uh, online sales, so there's a couple different ways that they keep their product local and that's why it's important to for our economy to some support those small farms. So if we're eating healthy, that means we're eating lots of fruits and vegetables. And sometimes when you're eating those fruits and vegetables, you're supporting our local economy. And then the last part that I um, mentioned there is, is how much do we eat out? That all impacts our diet. That all impacts where that product is coming from because some of the restaurants unless they say on their menu that they're supporting local farmers, it may not come from within Florida, that fruit or vegetable, it may come outside. And I know you're hearing me say, it's really important to support our local economy. That is in itself what sustainability is about. So here is our statistic. So when we talk sustainability, we're not just talking Florida, we're talking everywhere, the whole world. And one in seven people on this planet today go hungry, while others are well overweight and not eating correctly. So there's an inequality there on the ex access to foods. Not only that, and this is the one that still upsets me, and I always wish that if I could do anything, I'd do something. So women farmers don't get the same access to the resources out there that are available to males. Farming is still driven by men. And uh, they, uh, as far as resources, funding resources, there, uh, there are some, a few of them out there that are for just female farmers, but it's still very, very difficult for a female to become a farmer. Next component is our resource and our resources and our waste recovery. And I remember, I don't want to say this is the last component because it's all the circle and how it is all interconnected and interdependent. So resources, it really is working with our researchers and our educators like myself to know how to help these farmers in getting products that are going to be more sustainable. Uh, you're talking genetics and how to find the stronger genetics for different crops that they can grow at a larger volume. And it's all about education, extension agents like myself, getting out and talking to the community and having the community understand what is their relationship to the whole sustainability. So are our um, resources, are they renewable energies, biofuels, you know, some of these new areas that we're going into for biofuel is incredible as far as sustainability. And again, did I mention, what about that carbon food uh, footprint, you know, I almost said food print, but that would be about the same thing, foot and food. Um, annually, this is staggering. Each household wastes almost $2,000 in food. Wow. And that, to me, bottom line is that we don't value our food and our water like some other countries do. We are an industrialized country. And sometimes I know that value isn't there. I have been in meetings where bottled water has been offered and people will take two sips of it and then throw the entire bottled water away not even in the recycle bin. 
So there isn't that value. Like think of a, um, a developed country. There is a value for every drop that comes that they have of water. About 72 billion pounds of food is thrown out before it ever hits a refrigerator, whether that's your refrigerator or whether that's refrigeration for the production processing um, one of those processes. So we are trying to search different methods to actually recover food waste in Sarasota. There is an agent that that's all he does is he works with the school systems. He works at big events to make the connection to people that we need to capture our food waste and turn it into compost because of how much food is thrown out every single year. Most of the um, retail and the consumers, that's where this number is coming from. It's driven by us, the consumer. So damage and waste happen from the time something is harvested, through its shipment, through the um, market distribution system and how it's handled there, how it's displayed in the market in order of like refrigeration goes down there, spoilage, they're all, waste is there all along the, the way. And what can we do to kind of like stop some of these? So the picture here again is a picture of an apple tree. So we do apples up in the north part of Florida. And here's where you could have a gleaning system coming through and collecting uh, the product when the majority of those fruit are picked from the fruit, the, the tree itself. Nothing can be picked up off of the ground because once it hits the ground, unless you can assure for food safety that there isn't a bacteria that can enter it, you cannot use that product. And no farmer is willing to assure that that item that hit the ground cannot get introduced by um, E. coli or something like that. So the, the law says you do not touch anything that hits the ground. Even gleaners cannot touch what hits the ground because of food safety. So here's a map of our different types of countries, industrialized and um, uh, developing countries. And I wanted to throw out a couple more statistics. So developed worlds waste a third of food, but this is what's interesting. Their waste of food does not equate to what the industrialized countries did they are wasting food because they don't have the refrigeration to store it from the time it's picked to the time it moves through the system. They don't have the storage capability. So if they don't have the proper storage, then they, you get some waste going on there. Uh, transportation issues. They may not have the, the transportation like we do in industrial countries to get it from the farm to the cities or to where people are going to purchase them. So I uh, have a comment real quick. Can farmers put nets underneath fruit trees to use fallen fruit? Absolutely, as long as that fruit does not hit the ground. Once it hits the ground, we're in a different ball. There, we're in regulation that will not allow them. Um, so yes, it is safe because the unless that netting that they're using is not um, sanitized because again, because that fruit that falls into it it has juices and different things on it could have a fungus and if you're not capturing or cleaning that netting that can be an issue as far as food safety so it really depends on how they handle their netting to know if they can capture that fallen fruit sorry i didn't catch that question earlier on the last slide um, uh, in the comment says, do I mean developed or developing countries? I do mean developing. Thank you for that typo correction. Um, I will fix that. Sorry. So the next statistic is that industrialized countries though are and we're part of that country group of countries. We waste a third of food produced. Well, that's the same thing as the developing countries. But look at the reasons why. We are wasting it because retailers are ordering too much. They're not moving the volume of food that they're, they're getting. Consumers are buying too much. You know, we have to think back to when you go to a grocery store, do you take along a checklist and buy what's on that checklist? Or does your mind start to grab more things? When you don't have a checklist 
you tend to overbuy. When you stick to that checklist, you don't tend to overbuy. So you may not uh, buy extra fruits or vegetables that are gonna go bad because you didn't have a recipe to use them in. Um, and then here's the point I made earlier is our value of food and water in industrialized countries are not the va same value as those that are in developing countries. So until we value food and water more, we're gonna continue to have waste. So I'm going to go a little bit local and I have about 10 more minutes and then I'll wrap up this presentation. So locally, I'm sorry, nationally, here's some trends that I thought would be interesting for you to see. We just um, had USDA just came out with the 2017 results for um, how farms um, conduct themselves. And so the number of farms nationally have actually decreased but their acreage has increased. So they're actually learning that um, they, can use, they, can, um, the, they can expand themselves to get a little bit more production out of their land. The number of farms selling produce has actually decreased and their farm expenses have increased. And that, a lot of that has to do with regulation of distribution of processing, et cetera. Utilizing renewable energy producing systems has actually doubled, which is a really good thing. We're starting to figure out how to use those renewable sources. We're figuring out the importance of composting and putting that good nutrient back into the soil. And then the last item I have here for national trends is, is there's about more than 50% cut to the government aid for small farms. So remember how I said small farms are so, there's so many 80% uh, um, or more in some areas. So it, that is harmful when there is 50% cut from government aid to a small farm operation. It, that, it basically you use that saying, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Okay, Teresa, you make a good point about the little value we have in our food. Do you think this results in high subsidies for agriculture? Um, I think that our value um, to food can be along that way. You're absolutely right in, um, it doesn't compensate, those subsidies don't compensate. But I also think that it's, you think back to that industrial revolution and how wealth and, and you had wealth and you had this ability to buy and, and get material things. And I think that sometimes through evolution, that really hasn't gone away. That thought of, I've got money, I'm going to buy. And so we, I think that sometimes um, we can be more wasteful, but we don't value it because it's just not there. Versus think of our developing countries, they don't have it. And so for them, they are going to take pride. They're going to take, um, they're going to be using it as much, just the amount that they're needed. So it, it's just a complete, to me, a lot is that how we were raised, that mindset and industrialized versus developing countries. Good questions. All right, so um, here is a way for sustainability to happen and it is happening in farm in Florida. We have a farm to school program and that allows the farms to subsidize, subsidize um, getting their product directly to our school systems. Um, so here's just kind of a list of the different things that we are locally putting right into our school system. And it's awesome. So I'm going to go a little bit more. I'm, I'm going from that national level. I'm coming down to local and I'm just talking to you about some of the statistics of between Sarasota and Manatee County. So 26% of our farms are considered small farms and um, their annual sales for them to be considered a small farm is $250,000 or less. And because that number is so low, it's just because um, I have to accommodate Sarasota numbers as well as Manatee County. Manatee County, we have an incredible number of what is qualified in the census as a small farm. Um, we, we are finding that there are more out there when we visit them on their farm than what they are uh, qualifying in the census. And that's a big difference that we're seeing. 
Um, we have between the two counties, we have 34 farmers markets, you pick operations and produce stands. So that's a good thing, but are people finding those? That's the important thing. Um, uh, Sarah Bostic from Sarasota and myself, we're both working with a nonprofit called Transition Sarasota. And Transition Sarasota is an organization that actually list on their web page the different farms that we have that you can actually get uh, fresh fruits and vegetables from. And that can be not just the farm, but it it, had, it lists all the farmers markets. They um, Their system is down, they're revamping right now. So don't leave this program and go out and try to find that list because it's not quite back up there yet. And both of our, um, our counties, we do, uh, we're both involved in the farm to school programming. So here's a little bit more um, of direct local things. Uh, Sarasota actually, they've lost about 12% of their acreage since uh, 2007. And that's not a bad number. Uh, Manatee County actually, our agricultural uh, land has actually increased by 3%. And Manatee County has always been a huge agricultural community. Our number one crop is tomatoes and you know the majority that are grown here do go out of state. Uh, helps our economy first, but it does go out of state. So you think of that carbon footprint. Um, let's go back to Sarasota. So uh, their crops in which they are harvesting has actually doubled. And then their uh, agricultural commodities have actually dropped um, the types of commodities that they are growing. Manatee County, we've had a, an increase in crops, not by much, but a little bit. And then our sales have also increased. So that's some good things. So I'm gonna conclude here and I'm gonna go back to talking about the sustainability of food systems and some of the things. So I hope that you've heard, uh, heard me say that there's a lot of interconnection and interdependency in the food components, the food system components. And, and to make it a balanced system, we must include the environment, things that are happening to the environment, things that are happening to our society, things that are happening as far as our economy. It's all a balancing act. Um, until we start paying the true value for some of our co commodities, sustainability may be a challenge. So, and you know, that's somewhere where we can maybe do our point, our, our um, help with that process. And then um, my last good takeaway is, is, is what are you willing to do to increase the same sustainability in any of these components? Because it's all about us all having a role in this and what are we willing to do? So I say, it's up to you. Don't point that finger at agriculture or don't point it at a distributor distributor. Boy, I love it. It's been a long hour, right? Um, don't point the finger at somebody else. Because remember, when you're pointing your finger, there are five or at least three more fingers coming back at you saying, please do your part and be part of sustainability. And that's all I have. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to jump over to the question box real quick here. Wow. So I thankfully through the presentation part, I have absolutely covered all of them. And okay, well, I can't thank you enough for attending the presentation. It has been recorded. So we will actually have this up. Uh, Sarasota in Manatee County, we'll have it probably on our YouTube. Uh, but we also have it up there if somebody wants to listen again later, because I know you loved all the information. I appreciate the comments and everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you.